time. The rest of you folks, I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. I want to preach to you a message entitled, Am I My Brother's Keeper? Am I My Brother's Keeper? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word, Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. The message is entitled, Am I My Brother's Keeper? The Bible says in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 4, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now the word Cain in the Hebrew literally means gotten or begotten. Now Eve probably thought this was the promised Messiah of Genesis 3.15. But ultimately she had another son and she found out that it wasn't. Verse number two, she again bare his uh, brother Abel. Now the word Abel means a feeder. That's the Hebrew word, habel, means a feeder. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now a lot of people try to say the reason God did that was because Cain did not bring a blood sacrifice. Well, I don't know if that's really true, beloved, because God accepted grain sacrifices, and it says here, he brought a sacrifice to the Lord. The problem was his heart. The problem is our heart. We come to church and our heart is not in it. Amen? We come before the Lord and our heart is not in it. God always says, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. So he says here, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering because his heart was in it. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. No, Cain offered something, but his heart wasn't in it. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? I want you to see this, beloved. God says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? What a promise. If you do well, won't you be accepted? But I want you to see the precaution that he gives him here. He says, And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. In other words, sin is like a lion crouching at the door of your heart, at the door of your soul, at the door of your conscience. Now, I personally believe here that God had foreseen the intent of Cain's heart, the murderous intent that he wanted to kill his brother. He hated his brother. So God's giving him a warning here, isn't he? He says, and thou shalt rule over him. The Hebrew literally says, and thou should rule over him. In other words, this sin is now personified. That's the him. It says, Cain, I want you to overrule and overpower that sin uh, that's going to be knocking on the door of your heart and your mind and your life. I want you to do it. Now, believe hear me. Sin will always take you farther than you're willing to go. Sin will always cost you more then you're willing, or take you longer, I should say, than you're willing to stay and cost you more than you're willing to pay. Now that's a fact, isn't it? That's a decep deception, the deceitfulness of sin. And unfortunately, Cain had to learn the hard way, and Abel's blood was crying up from the ground under God. He killed me, he killed me, he killed me. Verse number 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? I want to speak to you this morning on that subject. Am I my brother's keeper? Let's go to the throne of grace. Father in heaven, this is a most profound question. Dear God, I would pray that you'd help us set aside the cares of this life, the cares of this world, as we stand in thy presence and hear the word of the Lord. Father, I pray that your supernatural hand would be upon this preacher. Lord, that you anoint the word and would find fertile soil in the hearts and minds and lives of thy people here in this congregation and also those who will hear this message or watch it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Now, beloved, we're all familiar with this story of how Cain slew his brother Abel, aren't we? 
And I'm not going to really get into that today, but I want you to notice verse 9 begins with God asking Cain a rhetorical and exploratical question that he already knew the answer to. Remember the Bible says that Cain's blood was crying up from the earth under God. And Cain also, beloved, already knew the answer to the question that uh, uh, God was asking him. So he gave God here a rather flippant and arrogant and disrespectful answer. God simply asked Cain, where is thy brother Abel? But in a cold and shameful tone of voice, filled with impudence and impertinence, beloved, his reply both insulted and it also uh, accused God. So Cain snapped back and tersely said this, I don't know where he is. You tell me where he is. That's what he was saying. He's saying, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to keep track of where he goes all the time? Am I the one who's to look out for his welfare when he's uh, walking around? Am I the one, Lord? What he's really saying to God is this, beloved. Is it now my responsibility? Is it now my duty? Is it now my job and my calling to keep an eye on Abel and check out what he's doing and check out where he's going and watch over his life? Is that my job now, Lord? So you can see Cain, beloved. He had a terrible attitude, didn't he? Cain had a serious attitude problem. Cain was a selfish and a self-centered person, the Bible teaches us. Cain is not our example of how to be our brother's keeper. He is our example of how not to be our brother's keeper. Would you say amen? Hey, listen to me, beloved. Don't you ever get mad at God like Cain did here if he zeroes in on your life and uh, wants to correct you in your life, beloved. And he, he does that sometimes, doesn't he? he? We're doing some sin. We know we shouldn't be doing it. And God. God has a way of pointing it out, whether it's through a saint, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through some unsaved person. But don't you get mad at God like Cain did. Why, Pastor Joel? Because he's only looking out for your welfare. He's trying to save your soul. Amen? Now, we don't like that, for sure. I don't like it. None of us like it. That's our humanity, isn't it? But, beloved, he's trying to save your soul. But like guilty and banished Cain, ladies and gentlemen, here we too we often get angry at God and others when they challenge us with these pointed and these probing questions like this to expose our sins and to expose our crimes against heaven. We too react defensively, don't we? We are oversensitive many times. We get angry and indignant when they do that. Why? Because our wrongdoings and our iniquities have now been laid bare and we can no longer hide our shin and sin and shame. Just Cain, he couldn't hide it any longer because God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God sees all things everywhere. Would you say amen? So we can't hide them from either God or man. So like Cain here, we also react and we reply in the flesh and indignantly we snap back at God or someone else and we do it with our own stupid and irrelevant uh, questions, ladies and gentlemen. Now, why do we do that? Someone will ask you a question or tell you something, and you know that if you answer this, it's going to expose you. So what you try to do is take them down a rabbit trail, turn the thing around, and get them on the defensive. You listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We do this because we try to deflect and avoid the real painful issues that we have now been challenged with and confronted with, beloved. So now we try to put the inquirer, the one asking the question, uh, these probative and provocative questions, we put them on the defensive. Why do we do it? I'll tell you why. So we can weasel out of not having to answer what we should be answering. And I'll tell you this, what I've learned in the ministry. I don't let anyone ever do that to me. Well, what about so and so? They have nothing to do with this conversation. It has to deal with you. Never mind them. God take care of them. This has to do with you. I will not go there with them because I know what they're trying to do is deflect the question Avoid answering it, because in their heart of hearts, they may already know that they're wrong. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, they don't want to admit, and we don't like to admit our guilt, do we? So Cain said to God, how do you expect me to know where he is? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to follow him around every minute of the day and know where he is? Am I now his guardian? Am I his caretaker that has been entrusted with looking out for him? No way. That's not my job. It's your job, Lord. You are God. That's what he's saying. Not my job. Your job. So what are we saying here? 
I'm saying we too often like to pass the buck to others. We try to squirm and wiggle out of what we know is our duty, then we're supposed to help others. So why do we do it? Because we're selfish and we're self-seeking, beloved. And we have little concern for others many times. So why do we do it? Because we don't like to be inconvenienced or disturbed or bothered by other people's pain and problems in our life. So why do we do it? Because, beloved, we don't like to sacrifice or share our time, unfortunately, our money and possession with others because we're so, we can be so materialistic and worldly orientated. Now, beloved, listen to me. The harder, it's easy to give money for me. I'm Not that I have a lot of money, but it's easy for me to give money. It's easy to give vegetables to you. And, I, and beloved, I don't say this because of me, but do you have any idea what it takes to grow vegetables? It's a lot of work, isn't it? But I delight in it. It's my catharsis. But it's hard for me to give my time. You want to know why? I can't buy it back. And people think nothing of using up your time, and half the time they don't listen to what you say anyway. But they'll take up an inordinate amount of your time. What am I saying? Sometimes, beloved, why do we do it? Because we often feel or fear our guilt and our shame that it's going to be exposed like Cain's was. And we have that, uh, and, and I should say because we're so prideful, beloved, and none of us like to be disgraced or humiliated by anyone or even by God. And God has a way of humbling us by doing that, doesn't he? He can make us disgrace. He can humiliate us. And he tries to do it not because he glories in humiliating us. He does it because he's trying to get our attention and get us saved and on back on the right track. You know, some people are, my dad used to say that, people are a glutton for punishment sometimes. If you always did what you always done, you're always going to get what you always got. And yet people do that. Right? You see, beloved, what am I saying? Now you'd think that God's probing and provocative question to Cain and us would be very easy to answer by all of us, but it's not. And beloved, you'd think that most people would just give a pat answer and say, sure, I'm my brother's keeper, but they don't say that. I just wonder how many would really answer with an unequivocal, yes, I am my brother's keeper. Amen, I am my brother's keeper. How many, I just wonder, I just wonder, ladies and gentlemen, how many would answer with an unequivocal, uh-uh, not me. There is no way. And like Cain, beloved, they say, am I my brother's keeper? Seriously? Really? Are you asking me that? I wonder how many people would say that. I'm afraid far too many. Oh, hear me now. All those with this same kind of poor attitude and careless reply will also be marked man like Cain was by God, and they'll be seen in God's sight, and God will deal with them. Why? Because Cain's response to God was one of gross carelessness. It was one of gross indifference, beloved, not only toward his brother, not only toward his family, but to Almighty God himself but especially, beloved, to other people. And this has been all too common throughout the course of human history. Me, 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 I, 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 I need, I need, I want, I want. I don't care about the other guy, that's his business. And yet, beloved, I hope as you're getting older, you're holding on to your house, your cars, your keys, your everything with a feathered grip. It all belongs to God anyways. You're not going to take it with you to the ground, and you're not going to get rewarded for it unless you share it with other people. Amen? You can have all the money in the world. Won't, not one, you won't get one reward on the day of judgment for accumulating wealth and material possessions. You won't get one. You just won't. But if you've shared that with other people, you will get something from Almighty God. You'll store up heavenly treasure. Would you say amen out there? Listen to me, beloved. When you ask most fo- folks, am I my brother's keeper? They say this. And I've had this said to me so many times. They say, no way, man. I've got enough to do to look out for myself. This is a dog-eat-dog world. This is the survival of the fittest, and it's every man for himself. It is a jungle out there. How many people do you know that say things like that? Boo, coo, would you say amen? It's a jungle out there. I got all I can do to take care of myself. Let him fend for himself. Let him get a job. Let him go do what he's going to do. I'm not my brother's keeper. And so like Cain, beloved, we still ask today, or should ask today, am I 
my brother's keeper. Does it really mean something to me now that I have become a child of God, that I have become a Christian, that I am a member of the family of God? Does that really mean something to me today? You see, beloved, and by the way, as I'm thinking of it, if, if you still ask this question, it shows you shun and you shirk your responsibility to others, and you are not your brother's keeper. Am I? Am I sure? Beloved, there shouldn't even be a question in your mind. Amen? There shouldn't even be a question in your mind. Since Cain and every generation has questioned how we ought to relate to needy people, beloved, we need to ask ourselves, do we hate them? What if they hate us or they're indifferent to us? What should we do then? Can't we just live and let live? And how does God want us to relate and react to other people, beloved? And hopefully today my sermon is going to answer these questions as I go through this. But I do want you to know this, beloved, about these soul-searching questions. Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper, was disrespectful to God. It was irresponsible. It was an excuse, beloved, a cop-out to try to get away from God or get God off his back. And the same is true for us if we do the same thing. Am I my brother's keeper? I know he needs some clothes. I know he needs some food. There's nobody else around. Now. He has no family whatsoever. Is it my responsibility? Yes. It is your responsibility. And I say yours. Mine too. Amen. So there's three truths I want you to see about am I my brother's keeper. Number one, beloved. The blessings of being my brother's keeper. The blessings of being my brother's keeper. I want you to look at verse number 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now that word keeper, shamer, in the Hebrew, means and denotes that Cain is asking this. Am I really my brother's guardian? Am I his caretaker? Am I really my brother's custodian, his overseer in life? Beloved, of course, the scripture answers this in the affirmative and the confirmative. And he says, yes, indeed, we're all the watch out for one another. Amen. Beloved, it's not just the pastor's job to do it. It's not just the elders or the deacon's job just to do it. It's not just the church's job just to do it. It's not just the government's job just to do it. It's your job also to do it. Would you say amen? To help out your neighbor. God says that's what he wants us to do. You see, beloved, it's all our jobs. Why? Because we're all citizens of the world and humanity. And yet many often foolishly ask, who is my brother? Now, Jesus was asked the same question, beloved, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you remember that. In Luke chapter 10, verse 29, a scribe came up to him one day trying to entrap him in his words. And Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, answered his question about what he must do to inherit eternal life. Then the scribe, the Bible says, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, beloved, this parallels and echoes this question, who is my brother, doesn't it? You see, Jesus went on to tell him and us that our brother, our neighbor, is anyone, anywhere, at any time that needs our love, that needs our help, that needs our care, and a dire and difficult trial or problem arises in their life, and we have both the means and the opportunity to help them. Beloved, people have come to me and say, Pastor Joel, so and so needs help. First thing I say to them, how come you didn't help them? Number two, do they have family? The Bible says you're not supposed to burden the church. You're supposed to go to the what? Family. Now, if they have no family, especially if they're a widow indeed, 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm going to go there. But if they are widow indeed, beloved, immediately we're going to go out of the way for that person. Amen? But they have to wash the saints' feet. They have to be hospitable to the saints. They have to be loving to God. They have to be faithful to God. Those were the conditions. If that widow was none of those things, she got not a dime from the church. And we know that not only from the Bible, but also from church history, by the way. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this. That when you have the means, and you have the opportunity to help someone, then do it. You hear me, beloved, their race, their religion, their gender, their social standing, their dress, uh, their skin color should have nothing to do with our decisions to help them. Why, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Because under their skin, their blood is just as red as yours. Under their skin, their pain and need is just 
the same as yours. Would you say amen? I'm saying that under their skin, ladies and gentlemen, their feelings of desperation, their feelings of worry and anxiety and fear are just like yours. So be your brother's keeper, and I assure you, God will bless you for it. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, we're all cut from the same bolt of cloth, aren't we? You listen to me. Let me get a little closer to home. Let me come into the church now. I mean, not just this local church, the church universal, the church of Christ on this earth. All Christians are related in Christ, like it or not. You may not like me, and I may not like you. But you know whether or not you like it or not, we're related. You see, beloved, we're all the family of God. And the New Testament says things like this to Christians. Christians, you ought to love and serve one another. Christians, you ought to receive and edify one another. This is what the Bible says. Christians, you ought to forgive and exhort one another. Christians, you ought to bear with and submit yourself one to another. Christians, you ought to honor and consider one another. Not just yourself, not just your family, not just your friends, but one another. That's what the Bible teaches, amen? Nowhere, beloved, listen to me. Being independent and having this every man for himself attitude is a revolutionary idea in our society and in our culture today, beloved. Nowhere is that ever taught in Scripture. The Bible says we are made for community. We are made for communion. We're going to have it today. We are made for fellowship, one with another. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, God said this. Now listen. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up the other. But woe unto him who is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two would withstand him. A twofold cord is not quickly broken. Now that's God's take on the whole issue. What's he saying to us? God's saying this. He says this productivity in numbers. He's saying there's safety and there's strength in numbers, isn't there? He's saying, ladies and gentlemen, that there's community and there's help in numbers. Oh, beloved, we ought to thank God. We ought to thank God for this church. And I'm saying this church, not only personally, but everybody that belongs to a good Bible-believing church, you ought to thank God that you belong to a church. Why, Pastor Joel? I want you to think of all the times folks that help you out because you belong to the church. I want you to think of all of the times, ladies and gentlemen, that folks have been there for you when you didn't deserve it, but they were there for you anyways, amen? I want you to think of all of the times, ladies and gentlemen, when people went out of their way to help you out. And beloved, it costs them something. Because it's never easy to do that, is it? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. That this loner and me only mentality is of the devil. It's of the deceiver himself, beloved. Why? So he can isolate you and ultimately deceive you and destroy you. That's what he wants to do. You see, beloved, Satan wants you totally consumed with yourself. Always fixed and focused on yourself. On your own self. On your own needs on your own wants, on your own desires, and not that of others, beloved. And that is ungodly narcissism. You say, preacher, what in the world is narcissism? I've heard it said all of the time, but I don't know what it means. Well, I'm about to tell you for a dollar. I'll tell you what it means, beloved. It means self-love. It means self-centeredness and absorption. Beloved, it it, it means that you're always looking inward and to yourself. And ladies and gentlemen, God utterly hates this. Now get this, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible predicts that in the last days before the coming of the Lord, this narcissistic, narcissistic attitude will be at pandemic proportions throughout the world and throughout the church just before the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And boy, do we see it now, don't we? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, This know also 
that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Narcissism. Lovers of their own selves, beloved. Then he goes on, he says, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. From, from such, the Bible says, withdraw yourself. Get away from them. Why, Lord? Because they have an outward semblance of God, don't they? But they deny the real power thereof, that God changes lives, that they're to serve the Lord, that their life is not their own anymore. So God tells us in the last days that's what's going to happen. And people are doing that. James warns in James chapter 5, people will store up treasures for the last days. Me, 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 I, I, I. Wouldn't be something. Jesus comes today and you save $10 million and didn't do anything with it. Burned up. Nothing. You worked, you sweat, you bled, you toiled, you sacrificed, you did all of that. And you got nothing for it. What a wasted life. Amen. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying the word brother is not just used here biologically or familiarly, that is with your siblings, but also humanely and universally of every single member of the human race everywhere in the world. And all men and women are related in our humanity by virtue of being created by God as members of the human race. Beloved, the Bible says in Acts 17, 26, that God hath made of one blood all nations. The same blood that's in me is in somebody in China or down in Africa or over in Australia, you know, governor, we're going to put a shrimp on the bobby. Okay, we all have that same blood. Would you say amen? Your blood's not any different than mine. Probably just not as hot. <laughs> and I get that from the hot peppers, brother, right? Did I? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that all fellow members of the human race qualify as our brothers, don't they? Since every person has needs, every first person requires some outside help from others at one time or another in their life. And ladies and gentlemen, no man is an island. You've heard that said. No man can do it all alone. It literally takes a village, doesn't it? You imagine where your kids would be if somebody wasn't watching out for them? Uh, I'll never forget when my kids were young. Uh, beloved, when I first started in ministry, I got a stipend, and I still do, by the way. But I got a stipend. And I don't know how my wife and I made it. I honestly don't, except for the grace of God. But I had an old bike that I had for my kids. And someone in the church saw it, and I came home one day, and two new bicycles were in my driveway. Now, I didn't know who gave it to me. I found out later who gave it to me. But I didn't know them. But you know what they were doing? They were being their brother's keeper. The Bible says we're to commun communicate our goods, our wealth, our possessions to those who teach us and preach to us and watch out for us and pray for them. God says you're to take your wealth and take care of them. Now, I'm not saying that so I can, but I could use a new car. No, I'm only kidding. Just got one. You see, beloved, how much do we owe people like that? How much do we owe someone who teaches us and preaches and sacrifices and tries to stand and hold the fort down? To be that constant in your world of variables. How much do you owe a person like that to get you to heaven? You tell me, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says people like that are worthy of double honor, double uh, rep uh, reputation in their remuneration. That's what that word means. How much do we owe them? We don't think about that. I thank God for every missionary, every evangelist, every pastor who's true to the word of God. But I thank God for people like that. You go out and do what you want to do, and you hope the church is going to be there when you come back. And most of the time it is. Why? Because of godly men. You ought to be thankful for that and get your life back in tune with God so you can get into heaven instead of going out and philandering in the world and getting lost. And if Jesus were to come, you'd split hell wide open. So, beloved, all people are our brethren. Now, I'm not brethren in Christ. But we all experience the same hardships and adversities, don't we? We all experience the same headaches and heartaches and the same grief and miseries. We all experience the same sufferings and sorrow in our life. So we should all care for one another's life. We should all care for each other's needs and burdens, beloved. We should care for everybody else's problems and difficulties. In other words, you need to be your brother's keeper. Amen? One day... Our Lord was asked by a scribe, what's the greatest commandment in the law and the prophets? 
And Jesus said this. Now listen. He said, the greatest commandment in the law and the prophets is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto the first. Namely, you should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets like your ten fingers hang off of your two hands. Amen? Or your two arms. Imagine all of the law and prophets. Every principle they taught was to love God and love man. Isn't that the Ten Commandments, ladies and gentlemen, the tables of the law? Your devotion on the vertical to God, your devotion on the horizontal toward man. So this means that, beloved, we're not only to love and help out our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're also to love and help people, all mankind, beloved, wherever there's a need. Now listen to what Paul said to the church in Galatia in Galatians 6 stands. He says, as we have opportunity... Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are the household of faith. Do good to who? All men. Especially to who? Other Christians. In other words, what he's saying to us is all other true believers, regardless of their denominations, regardless, ladies and gentlemen, of their denominational quirks or doctrinal quirks. Now listen, that means this. I may not agree with a Pentecostal, but if he's living a holy, righteous, and godly life, and up to the, all the light that he knows, you know what? He's my brother in Christ, isn't he? Now, I may not agree with his tongues and his baptism of the Holy Spirit and the things that he's doing that with, beloved. He's wrong in that area. But listen, we're wrong in areas too, all of us. We're not God yet. We'll never be God, but, but we're not God is what I'm saying. So can I love a Baptist? It's hard to do, hard to do. But of course I can. Can I love a Nazarene? Never, never, no, no, of course I do. They, they, in fact, they believe just like us. The old Methodists, exactly like we believe. So just because someone says, well, I speak in tongues. They say, yeah, I speak some Japanese too. Right? But you see, beloved, listen to me, because I want to teach you what this doesn't mean. Listen to me. To be your brother's keeper does not mean to enable them to continue in sin and in their wrongdoing. To be your brother's keeper does not mean to cover them, cover for them by lying in order to keep them out of trouble when they break the law. To be your brother's keeper does not mean to do for people what they can and should be able to do for themselves. Uh, to be your brother's keeper does not mean to constantly and continuously, now listen to me, bail uh, 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 or uh, yeah, bail people out of bad and painful situations that they get themselves into because of their own negligence or irresponsibility of making bad decisions and committing unrighteous acts in their life. God said you're not to be your brother's keeper in those things. See, all those things are wrong. They violate, grossly violate the law of God. Amen? But listen to me, I'm not through yet. To be your brother's keeper does not mean to micromanage another person's life or to make decisions for them, or to poke your nose into their personal business where it's not wanted, or to butt into their affairs when you're not asked. The Bible warns and commands us not to be nosy busybodies and meddle in other people's affairs. Amen? That's how not to be your brother's keeper. Now, a lot of people do that. They become enablers. Parents in sin, they're an enabler. Instead of doing the tough love that they need to do. And beloved, listen to me. I'm not trying to put your feet in the fire. What I'm trying to do is teach you something. How do you expect God to undertake for you if you join in the sin of the person and know them and you're breaking God's law? Will God go to work on that person's life then? Is God going to honor your stand? Is God going to honor your prayers when you won't even do what you know is right before God? Of course not. And so we have a tendency sometimes because we can... I love that person. He's my son, my daughter, my sister, my brother, my husband, my wife... Well, beloved, nobody's telling you not to love them, but we're telling you to love God first. God says, if you love father or son, mother or daughter, husband or wife more than you love me, you are not worthy of me. Now, what does that mean? You tell me. See if you can be faithful and preach it. So God says, I don't want you to meddle in other people's affairs. I don't want you being a busybody. I don't want you to be so nosy and poking your beak in like a camel under the tent to look around and see what's going on. I once read a story about an EMT who stopped into this little cafe one day to have a bite to eat. And as he sat down, beloved, and he sat down to eat, 
He started drinking a few beers, which he was forbidden to do, by the way, according to the rules of being an EMT. Amen? But suddenly he got a call from his dispatcher to respond to an emergency. Now the EMT was beside himself, and in a panic, he then asked a stranger that sat next to him to tell his dispatcher uh, that he couldn't hold the phone because he was trying to get the cat down from being up in a tree. Well, this was the first thing that popped into his mind. But what he actually said to the guy sitting next to him was this. He says, man, I can't go right now because I've been drinking and it's against the rules. Now the stranger, not wanting to get the EMT into trouble, thought he'd do him a solid. Thought he'd do him a favor. So he repeated this to the caller on the phone. He said, hello? And the dispatcher said, yes. He said, um, um, he can't come to the phone right now because he's up in a tree trying to get a cat down. So he can't respond to this emergency. And then as the dispatcher questioned him, he started making up all kinds of lies. He told lie after lie after lie, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this dispatcher. Why? Because he was trying to help out this poor, drunk EMT so he wouldn't get fired. But the story goes on and says, but that night, the EMT and the stranger who lied for him saw themselves on spy TV. Can you imagine, beloved? And they learned that they had... And so, I mean, I, I couldn't stop laughing when I read this. The next day, the EMT was fired. Why? Because his boss also saw it on TV, beloved. You know, the Bible says, be sure, be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. Whatever you plan, it's coming back to you. And there, but for the grace of God, so go I. So I better put it under the blood. It'll come back. A lot of the pain and heartache you have in your life is because you planted the crop. And you're just reaping what you sowed. Amen? You listen to me, beloved. This stranger, this guy that lied for the EMT, he was not being his brother's keeper. He was being an accomplice in this man's lies. Would you say amen? And Romans 14, 12 warns us, So then, each of us shall give an account of ourselves uh, to God, beloved. And there's a big difference. Now listen to me. There's a big difference in lying for the greater common good to save innocent lives. You see, that's what Rahab the harlot did for the spies. Amen? There's a big difference in doing that, beloved. Like the midwives that Pharaoh said, I want you to Shipra and Pua. I, I want you to take those babies when they're born and kill them. But she said, no, they're just, they're too frisky. You see, the babies come out before we even get there. She, see, she lied to save their lives. In other words, beloved, they were their brother's keeper. Would you say amen? They did it for the greater common good, not selfishly. What am I saying to you? I'm saying God blesses those who help and succor His people and others. That God richly blesses those who aid and assist His people and others, and they comfort and support His people and others. So I ask you this morning, can you truly say, I am my brother's keeper. I will be there for him. I will have his back. You know, in the Marines, we used to say, I got you six o'clock. In other words, you're walking toward noon. But the guy's got your back, 6 o'clock behind you. I got your back, and you do. You have a guy called Telgun Charlie. on a, a patrol, there's five or six of you, and the last guy's like this. See, all of you are facing this way, but he's what? He's Telgun Charlie. He's walking, watching your back trail. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying, number one, the blessings of being a brother's keeper. Now, I'm going to give you two quick other points. I want to finish this. The business of being my brother's keeper. In other words, are we really responsible, really, Pastor, for being my brother's keeper? The answer is an emphatic and an unequivocal yes. Amen. Absolutely. Beloved, we need to settle this in our heart right now and not pass the luck to other people. Go see Pastor Joel. Go see Tom. Go see so-and-so. You do it. Amen. And if then try to help some, get somebody else to help out there. You see, beloved, the answer to Cain's probing and provocative question in Genesis 4, 9, am I my brother's keeper, is found in what Jesus said in John 15, 13. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen? 
greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. You know, 1 John 3.16 echoes it by saying this. Now listen. This is the apostle that leaned, leaned on Jesus' breast. He says, Hereby we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Would you say amen? So does God really expect us to be my brother's keeper? Yay. Uh-huh. You know it. You betcha. Of course he does. Even to the point of laying down your own life for your brother. Let me give you a couple quick examples in the Old Testament. And there's all kinds of implications, but I'm trying to focus on one aspect of it. For example, beloved, the Bible says in Genesis 38 of Onan that because he did not uh, act on his dead brother's uh, behalf, his best interest, and raise up posterity unto his children. Instead, the Bible says he spilled his seed on the ground, and so God struck him dead. That's called the Leverite Law. Uh, it, it, it's, it's found in all societies, by the way, even before the, the Code of Hammurabi, before the writing of the Bible, that if a brother died and he didn't have to carry on his name, you were supposed to marry his widow, and the first son, firstborn son, took the name of the departed one, and he would keep that family going, his posterity. So Onan loved the activity, so to speak, but he did not want the responsibility. God struck him dead. You see, beloved, the Bible says that in Joshua 6 that Achan disobeyed God, did not act on the best interests of the children of Israel, but himself when he stole the accursed thing. And then ultimately he was found out and he was stoned to death according to what God wanted him to do. You see, he wasn't his brother's keeper, was he? He was supposed to be looking out for the community of Israel because God punished or blessed Israel as a community at that time. You see, beloved, the Bible Ten of the priests, Nadab and Abihu, that God struck them dead with a bolt of lightning, beloved, and literally burned them up because they offered strange fire on his altar and did not look out for the welfare of the children of Israel. Beloved, none of these men were their brother's keeper. Amen? You see, beloved, they had no care for others. They had no concern or regard for others. Beloved, the question is, do you? In other words, do you always expect others to be your brother's keeper when you will not even be a brother's keeper to anyone? A lot of people are like that. I want somebody to do this for me. I need them to do it to me. How come the church is not doing it for me? Well, what are you doing for the church? What are you doing for other people? Isn't this you sow, you reap? Look, sit down with yourself today. Make a list. What did I do for someone? That would probably be very sobering, wouldn't it? And scary. Brother, when's the last time you reached out to someone? When's the last time you touched their life with your benevolence or your generosity or kindness? When's the last time you did it? When's the last time you helped someone out, beloved? Are you your brother's keeper or are you like Cain? That's a question you're going to have to answer, not me. You see, beloved, in Galatians 6, 5, it says this. We read it this morning. It says, for every man shall bear his own burden. That is carry his own load. But sometimes, beloved, he can't. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it gets too heavy and he's unable to handle it all by himself. Amen? So what he needs is someone to now help him and be his brother's keeper. And that's why Galatians 6.2 also says, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the love of Christ. Not only are you to carry your own burden, but when you see a brother can't carry his own, uh, his, you go over and you help him. Amen. Bear ye one another's burden. That Greek word literally means carry it until the issue is resolved. Carry it to its fulfillment. That's what it means. Boy, this takes the focus right off ourselves, doesn't it? We're so preoccupied. I sound I'm going to do this. Am I going to get this? Do I look good enough? Do I look? Oh, beloved, I want to tell you something. Do you know, listen to me. I get a kick. I, I honestly get a kick out of men who are supposed to be educated, and they're trying everything. They're saying, if you eat this food, if you take these vitamins, and half of them don't even know the science behind it, beloved. And I hate to say that, but that's true. They don't know how the Bible, the body works biochemically or uh, electromagnetically. They don't have any clue of that. But the bottom line is, they say, we're gonna, this will help you live longer. This is going to help you do this. It's going to help you do that. Hey, listen to me. There's a curse on man. 
And that curse will not be reversed until Jesus comes again. Would you say amen? Listen to me. If Jesus doesn't come, you're going to die. Ladies, you're going to get fat. Ladies, listen to me. Your skin's going to sag. That's just a fact. Now, it may not seem it right now, but let you get a little bit older. Would you get my age? Everything goes south. I mean, right down to the face, down to your knee, <laughs> down to your feet. <laughs> now, you can exercise, and you should. You should eat good, and you should. But you're not going to reverse the curse. Jesus is. So what I'm trying to do is a little preventative maintenance to forestall the inevitable. <laughs> How about you? You see, beloved, that's what we need to do. Amen. Listen to me, beloved. We are not to carry our brother's burden for him, but help him do it and make it easier for him to bear it. So we're not to do it all, but assist him with their own burdens because they need to understand that we also have burdens in our life just like them. Hey, you know what? I've got all kinds of burdens. How about you? We all, you see, beloved, we all have them, don't we? Now thank God for those people who have enough grace on them, who have enough uh, uh, love inside of them, that they'll go out and they'll help other people with their burdens even when they have their own. You thank God for that, amen? But that's the way Jesus wants us. Listen, beloved, you've got you to turn away from the philosophy of this world. You've got to turn away from the Internet. You've got to turn away from social media. Me, me, me. I promote myself. I want to be honored. I want this. You've got to turn away from that. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying too often we don't want people to experience any pain. Too often we don't want people to have to face the consequences of their own actions. Too often... We don't want people to pay the price of their own sin, so we become enablers of their sin, and we make excuses for why they didn't take ownership of their own responsibilities. I cannot do it for them. I can't do it for my wife. I can't do it for my children. I can't do it for you. All I can do is preach to you and try to teach you and try to be the example for you. That's all I can do. And if you want to do it, try to help you out in doing it. You see, beloved, sometimes we make it too easy for people, don't we? And I want to tell you, when my kids were growing up, literally, beloved, I made them do things. I made them the sweat of their brow. I told you one time, Kobe wanted my truck when he got his license. My truck was worth seven grand. I sold it. I said, Kobe, you want the truck? Oh, Daddy, I need it. I said, good. Keep working. It'll be a thousand bucks. Now, I could have given it to him, and I wasn't really looking for the thousand dollars, but I could have used the seven thousand. But why was I doing that? I was trying to teach him a greater principle, amen? That he saw mercy in dad, he saw kindness in dad, he saw generosity in dad, but he also saw his own responsibility. And that a brother's keeper doesn't bear the whole thing. You ought to bear your own thing, amen? Listen to me, beloved. We need discernment in this. Why? Because there's a fine line between being, being my brother's keeper and being an enabler of their sin and their irresponsible lifestyle. Amen? Our attitude should be the same as the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, what? But to minister. I didn't come down here so people could bow down before me and uh, uh, serve me all the time and do this for me and do that for me. I came to do this for them. And God says, that's the attitude I want you to have. Oh, beloved, you listen to me. The book of Philippians says this in chapter 2, verse 4. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Don't just keep your focus. Oh, I really need this. I need a couch. But you know what? They need a car. You got a car to get you around. So what if you're a little uncomfortable right now? You bless them. God will bless you. Be your brother's keeper. Am I my brother's keeper? Amen. So what have I taught you? Number one, the blessings of being my brother's keeper. Business, number two, of being my brother's keeper. Now close with this. I've still got three minutes according to this. Can you see that? Of course you can. Okay, you'll hear it beep. Probably going 20 minutes over. No, I'm going to The burden of being my brother's keeper. I've already alluded to it. Beloved, it takes work. It takes effort, doesn't it? 
It takes patience and love to be your brother's keeper. Indeed, doing that is in and of itself a labor of love. Giving a helping hand to folks who need it, beloved, when they have trials and troubles and tribulations in your life, God says, I want you to do it. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it in obedience and as an act of worship and love for me. Offer it up to me as a sacrifice. Do it for me. Do it for me. Do it for me. Be your brother's keeper. Help them. Visit them. Call them. Beloved, listen to me. You ought to thank God. Thank God if somebody calls you because they're not seeing you in church. That means the Spirit of God has laid it on someone's heart to stir them up, to care for your soul, to call you up. You ought to thank God when someone comes up to you and says, Listen, I heard you got a problem over here, and they want to help you. That means the Spirit of God is at work, doesn't it? They take care not only for themselves, but they care for you. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. It says, Pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father, is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That is pure religion. Not you going out and doing all these other crazy things. You keep yourself unspotted from the world. You go and visit people, beloved, widows, fatherless, orphans. God says, now you're talking. Now you're talking. Now you are being your brother's keeper. Now you are making sure that you're ministering to other people and not just having them minister unto you. You see, beloved, don't be careless or indifferent or cold toward the needs of others like selfish and self-centered Cain was. He had no concern or regard for the needs of others. Your telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ and about his love, beloved, won't mean one hoot if they don't see his love in you. Amen? Remember, beloved, James says, faith without works is dead being alone. You can believe everything you want to believe. That's not going to get you to glory. Without works... Faith, you're not going there. Faith without works. Works are the evidence, the expression, and an exercise of a true, saving, loving faith. Come on and say amen out there. You're telling others about the love of Jesus won't mean much if they don't see his love in you. I guarantee you, beloved. Why? Why would anybody want what you've got in Jesus if they don't see that you have what he had? Why would they want it? You see, beloved, the proper response when someone reaches rock bottom in their life should never be, he made his bed, let him lie in it. You've heard that many times. It should be this. There but by the grace of God, so go I. I'm thankful I got food on my table. I'm thankful I got clothes on my back. I'm thankful I got a church to attend. I'm thankful I got friends in that church. I'm thankful for these things. Because when you're down and out, beloved, it isn't going to be some guy from down the street. You're going to come right to the church, I guarantee it. Oh, help me. Only one can get a hold of the throne of God is you guys. I need your help. I need the power of God's spirit in my life. I need his grace in my life. I need someone to be my brother's keeper. The proper response when someone reaches rock bottom, beloved, is that very thing. Listen to me. Someday... Someday, the shoe may be on the other foot, and you want someone to go out of their way to help you. Amen? In Matthew 25, 35, Jesus said this. Because you know the law of reciprocity. As you sow, you reap, right? But Jesus said this in Matthew 25, 35, beloved. Because on the day of judgment, when the Lord comes, and that great one th- white throne judgment uh, happens, He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to take the sheep and put them on his right hand. And he's going to take the goats and he's going to put them on his left hand. And then he's going to say to the sheep on his right hand, I was hungry and you gave me some meat or food. I was thirsty and you gave me some drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the sheep are going to scratch their head. And they're going to say, when did we ever see you? without food, or thirsty, or, or naked, or in prison. Jesus said, insomuch as you have done it unto one of these, the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And he's going to say to the goats on his left hand, I was hungry, but you didn't give me any food. You knew I was thirsty, but you didn't give me any drink. I didn't have 
any clothes on my back, and you wouldn't even come give me any. I was in prison. You didn't come visit me. And Jesus is going to say to the one on the left hand, depart from me into everlasting fire. Now that's pretty serious. You see, the sheep, Jesus said, when you did it unto one of these, the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. In other words, you were your brother's keeper. When you don't do it, what is God saying? You're not your brother's keeper. What? Am I my brother's keeper? That's the sight of the sermon, isn't it? Am I? I hope you can say amen. I am. I am my brother's keeper. And if you're not, I'm going to repent of that, and I will be my brother's keeper. From now on, I'm going to look out for my brothers in Christ. From now on, I'm going to look out for my sisters in Christ. From now on, I'm going to be a good neighbor. I'm going to look out for people that need a hand. From now on. And God will give you the grace and the means and the opportunity to do it. He'll test you with that. 